Welcome to our final webinar on the writing process. The first webinar talked about the writing process as a general academic strategy. The first webinar looked at the first phase of planning, which is understanding assignment instructions, planning and pre-writing, and researching and developing ideas. The um, third webinar covered the drafting phase, which includes outlining and writing. And today we'll be talking about the final phase of the writing process, polishing. This includes revising, which is shaping the paper, looking at the structure of the assignment, formatting, organization, double checking your research. Editing is at the sentence level, looking at wordsmithing style, flow, voice, and then proofreading is that nitty gritty, grammar, punctuation, and presentation. This phase is often skipped because, and I've been there, you finish a paper and you want it done and sent, but it's really worthwhile to give it a couple of days before you start revising, editing, and proofreading because you will catch so many errors and you will definitely improve your grade by investing time in this stage. Another way to look at this stage is from more general to specific in a way, or broader to more narrow. Revision is the big picture ideas, making sure the paper looks like a paper, is it in the right formatting, head, subheadings in the right places, double spaced, um, does, does the thesis match the paragraphs or the paragraphs in the right order? It's the overall paper. Editing, we're now going to get down to the sentence and looking at each sentence and thinking about flow and voice and style and then going through the whole paper with that fine tooth comb, looking for stray punctuation, extra spaces, changes in font, all these little things that may seem insignificant but are actually uh, distractions to your instructor when they're reading and we want to remove as many distractions as possible so that they can just focus on the essay itself. So um, when we think about this in terms of what we're focusing on in this part of the writing process, revising would be like looking at your title page or making sure that you have an appendix or your references page is all complete, everything's together. Editing, making sure that your quotations are integrated properly and then proofreading, like double checking your citations and looking at grammar. How long does this take? Well, with shorter documents, under 500 words, I would leave it for 48 hours following your first draft, have someone read it, and then it might take one to three rounds of going through it just to make sure it's ready to submit. For longer documents, do not be in a rush. It is worth your time. So leave it for three to five days if you can. Have someone read it. We can do that for you at the right site. And understand that it takes multiple rounds to go through a paper to make sure that it's in appropriate shape to submit. So what would we be focusing on in these rounds? Formatting, organization, coherence, and cross-checking research. Why do we do rounds? Because if you try and do all those things I just mentioned, formatting, organization, coherence, cross-checking research at the same time, it just opens it up for errors. Whereas if you do single tasking, you're hyper-focused, efficient, thorough. You're reading for one thing. I'm reading only for formatting. I'm reading only for organization. I'm reading only for research. It helps you scan the paper and zero in on those elements that need to be corrected. This will help with productivity and also helps to control feelings of overwhelm. Let's look at a round of revision. So in formatting, what would I be looking at when I'm reading my paper, paying attention to formatting? I'm gonna look at my documentation style that's necessary for this paper. And if I'm unfamiliar with it, this is a great opportunity to work with a writing coach 
at the right site who can help you with the finer details of documentation formatting. But the kinds of things that we would format using a documentation style include the title page, the references, tables and figures and appendix, app appendices, abstracts, using subheadings. Um, these documentation styles are designed to standardize a paper so that when your instructor reads it, they they're expecting it to look a certain way. And if something is off, it's going to be distracting to them. And if it's profoundly off, they may even ask you to reformat it before submitting it. So we really want to dedicate some serious time to documentation and making sure that the presentation of the paper is compliant. Organization doing a dedicated round of revision focused on organization. You want to look at your paragraphs. Are they in the right order? Is there one topic per paragraph? In the previous webinar, I talked about a reverse outline. And a reverse outline is when you take your draft and you annotate it, meaning that you read your a paragraph and you write a one sentence summary per paragraph. So if you have a nine paragraph paper, you'll have nine sentences at the end. What this does is it helps you see if your paragraphs are too long, if they're, if they're talking about more than one topic, if something's under, underdeveloped or overdeveloped, and it just helps with paragraph organization. So that's, just, that's something you could do as a revision strategy to smooth out the paragraphing in your paper. With paragraphs, they're also, kind, they're also used visually for the instructor. So if the instructor looks at your paper and sees a mini paragraph, followed by a really long one that goes on to the next page, followed by a couple mini ones, it's not going to look consistent and balanced. It makes it seem like your argumentation is not balanced. So try and keep your, your body paragraphs relatively the same length. It doesn't have to be right down to the exact number but balanced enough so that it looks like you've thought through each topic equally. You want to make sure that your paragraphs also flow from one to the next. Does it make sense that the order are, that they're in or should they be rearranged logically? If you are using subheadings, this is a great time to review the subheading hierarchy. What, what is the formatting for level one, two, three, four, five subheadings? Are they used properly in your paper? Could your paper use subheadings? Are you writing a big long-term paper in APA without subheadings? Subheadings help the reader. It helps them organize their reading experience. So you may want to review subheadings and think about how you can implement them. For coherence, uh, when you're so now we're starting again at the very beginning of the paper, focused on coherence. We're going to look at the thesis statement. Is it clear? Now, it may be clear to you, this is why having an extra reader will help, will help kind of answer this question because they may find this isn't clear. And that can help you refine the thesis statement a little bit more. Um, having that reader can also, they can also highlight that it's maybe not answering the assignment question or maybe the body paragraphs aren't supporting the thesis or maybe they are and the essay has really great control and flow. Getting feedback from a reader that's friendly and trustworthy and, um, and, and ideally someone not in your discipline um, can be really useful feedback at streamlining and revi revising your paper. Um, for coherence, you could also use the reverse outline. And this way, the way you do this is that for each paragraph, you're also asking, you're not only asking what the topic of the paragraph is, you're asking what is the paragraph doing? Is it arguing? Is it claiming? Is it providing evidence? Is it defining? And take a look at the sequence of paragraphs just to make sure that they make sense. Because it, do we really want to be arguing before we're defining, for example? We might want to define first and then argue after. That might be a more logical sequence. And uh, this could be a useful tool to you. Here's an example of such a reverse outline. So you would just number the paragraphs, one, two, three. Write down the main point of what's happening there. What is the paragraph doing? And then give yourself another column with revisions. 
you might say like for number one, okay, this needs more context. Whereas number three, this is okay. And then you can just check off paragraph three and you don't need to really work on the coherence in that paragraph. So you can just create like a little word table for yourself with these headings and then use that to go through your paper and just when you're reading for coherence to make sure that it makes sense, that the order makes sense and that they're actively substantiating your thesis. Another way to cross-check coherence, and remember coherence means is the essay making sense, is to look at the rubric. The rubric is basically the marking guide. It's the guide that the instructor will use to grade your paper. If you can't find one for your assignment, ask your instructor for one. So, and they can look different. They, they can all look very different, but generally you'll have some criteria like Engage, in this case, engagement, perspectives, and use of examples, and then a range of performance. This, in this case, it's from limited to exceptional. So what I would do is first look at the criteria, engagement, perspectives, use of examples. In another um, grading criteria, it might be something like uh, mechanics, style, grammar, research, content, something like that. Look at each one and go through your paper and see if you've met that criteria. Have you done it? And if you have, you can cross it out. If you haven't, you highlight it. It really helps with prioritizing and helps you double check that you're actually meeting the assignment instructions. When we first start with an assignment, that's the first thing we do is we read the assignment instructions. But then we get we move away from that because now we're reading into the research and we're coming up with an outline or writing the paper and those assignment instructions can get fuzzy and faded because it's because we're not really thinking about that at this point so it's a great time to go back to the beginning and read it all again and i find sometimes assignment instructions can be very long and specific and detailed making it very easy to miss something I've certainly written a paper, gone back to the assignment instructions, and I've said, yep, yeah, done this, 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 oops, didn't do that. And, and you're giving yourself an opportunity to fix it before submitting it. This is why we don't submit first drafts. It's also a good idea when you're facing your um, grading criteria to look at that performance variations. What constitutes limited? What constitutes underdeveloped? satisfactory and what makes it exceptional and you can try it's hard to have that perspective but you can try and evaluate yourself and think am I where where am I roughly on here rubrics are nice because when they give when you get your assignment back with the rubric it can show where your strengths and challenges are and that can help you in preparing for the next assignment Um, another revision round is cross-checking your research. So you want to double check your paraphrases, that they're not word for word, that you're not committing unintentional plagiarism. You want to read your paper for claims that need citations. What is a claim? Well, there's a difference between claims and common knowledge. So if you say something thinking it's common knowledge, could you take that idea, go to a mall, Ask 100 people and 95 of those 100 would understand what you're talking about. If that's the case, that would be common knowledge. But if you ask 100 people and five people know, then that's a claim that needs backing up. So just make sure when you're making statements that you have research to back up your ideas. You also want to pay attention to numerical data in your paper, like percentages, weather, dates, currencies statistics and make sure that those have citations. You need to indicate where those numbers come from. Are you oversighting? Do you think, or in your paragraphs, is it mostly um, quotations and paraphrases? Is every sentence sourced? If it is, you need to dial that back and make sure that your original thoughts are in there um, equally or more so. This is your paper. You have to demonstrate your critical thinking and you don't want it so heavily sourced that it drowns out your writing. On the other hand, do you have entire paragraphs without a single citation? Uh, depending on your assignment, that might be an issue. And so you may want to go through and, and pay attention to that and think this paragraph definitely needs 
some citations just to build up that research component. As well are there block quotes. So block quotes are quotes that are over four lines. The problem with block quotes is that they dominate word count and they take away from the writing voice of the paper. If you're writing a very long paper, let's say 3,500 words plus, it's okay to have one or two block quotes in there because the paper's long enough that your writer's voice will remain dominant. But in a short paper of a thousand words and when you have two block quotes in there, it's not a good idea. It's not recommended because it's just, it's just too dominating. So find a way to pair those back. Look at the quote and think, what is the essential message here? Do I really need all of these words? Or can I really shrink it down to its most essential message? You also want to cross check your original thought because you want this paper to be your expression of ideas. And so um, when you make a paragraph, when you take a paragraph like this, use the highlighting tools on one just to see how much of it is quotes, how much of it is summary and not analysis, how much of it is someone else's ideas and not your own. And it really can give you a strong visual indication of the ratio of your original thought compared to um, sourced ideas. Revision tools, like I, I was talking about the reverse outline as an option, using the rubric as an option, um, having a friend read, read it over is really valuable. They can catch things that, um, that you may have missed. If you have the time, it's great to have someone read it over who's not in your discipline just to see if a person can understand it from a layperson perspective. If you do have somebody who is in your discipline, they can also be a really good reader because they can point out inconsistencies that a person outside the discipline may not even notice. You can come to us at the right site and you, you can work with us as a general reader. Another idea is to read your paper out loud. And so read it to your cat. <laughs> when you read it out loud, it slows you down. When you're reading, we scroll, we skim, we scan, and you can miss errors that way. But when you read it out loud, you have to read every single word sentence by sentence. And <clears throat> you can pick up, your ear can pick up um, on awkward sentence structures or sentences that just don't sound right. And that's a good way to identify sentences in your paper that need a little bit more attention. How do I know when I am done revising? When you're tempted to submit it because it looks formatted, it reads more smoothly, the paragraphs are organized, the references are clean, correct, but don't submit it yet. It's still not ready. Let it sit for, if you can, another 48 to 72 hours. And, and, and a good time to do this is when your reader takes another look at it. That might be a really good way to multitask that time frame. You want to return to it with fresh eyes. Let's move on to editing. So we're editing for readability. We're looking at flow, wordsmithing, style, voice. What is flow? So... This is a picture of Point Grey Secondary in Vancouver. I used to teach there. And when I was there, they installed this beautiful new running track. And it's just, it's such good quality. And it's, I think it's one of the nicest ones in the city. Um, and I recently went to Vancouver and went there and it's still in good condition. Flow is, imagine you're on a running track and you just want to run your laps and you don't want to have barriers in your way unless of course you're training for hurdles, but you don't want to have people walking slowly in front of you. So you have to run around them or like garbage and debris on the track that you have to dodge. You don't want big puddles that you have to dance around. You just want to get your run in and be done. That's what flow is in a paper. It is sentences leading into the next smoothly, easily, consistently so that the reader doesn't get lost. So how do we how do we even start with with that? Part of that is honestly getting a reader to read your paper and to indicate when they get a little bit confused. Those moments of confusion are the slow walkers on the track who might be 
becoming a barrier. So that is something that we're going to be focusing on while we're editing is flow. Wordsmithing is when we're taking those rough sentences. Remember in the previous webinar, I said, don't write and tweak at the same time. Wordsmithing is tweaking. Now we're tweaking. We want to go into each sentence and read it out and think if it's the most concise, direct way of saying that is a repetition with the language. So when we're looking at wordsmithing, we're focusing on clarity. We don't want too many short sentences because that can read really choppy. We also don't want very long sentences because then they can become confusing. So we want to smooth that out. We want to reduce those tra transitional words like moreover and henceforth and therefore and, uh, you know, forthwith <laughs> because they can be a little bit awkward and cre create kind of a choppy flow. We don't want all of our sentences to, to be constructed the same. Like, for instance, this is la la la. Next sentence, this is la la la. Next sentence, this is la la la. You know, it's very formulaic that way. We want to change it up a little bit and to make it fresh for the reader. And the same goes for vocabulary by eliminating repetition. This is something, this is why I ask you to give it a couple of days uh, without looking at it because it's, you can notice these errors when your eyes are fresh. You may not see that repetition it, when you've been looking at the paper for so long. So you might notice that in a sentence, you're saying the word repeat three times. Let's change that up and add some different words. You want to focus on specific word choice. That means instead of using words like things, stuff, many, you want to replace that with a more specific word. You want to make sure that each sentence sets up the next sentence so that it flows together. And one way to do that um, is to read it out loud. And if you find that you're kind of hesitating at the beginning of the next sentence because you're not really sure how you got there, it just means you need a transitional sentence to bridge the gap. Another thing to do with wordsmithing is to really control wordiness. And wordiness just means a sentence packed with too many words. I think there's a perspective that to be academic, you have to have really long sentences packed with intense vocabulary and it's not true because clarity is most important. You don't want your reader losing focus. And they can lose focus if you have so much academic vocabulary in a single sentence. So just dial it back a little bit. And one way to do that is to eliminate adjectives and eliminate adverbs. Adjectives are words that describe nouns. Adverbs are words that describe verbs. And do we really need them? Do I need to know that someone ran quickly when when they just ran already indicates speed. We don't need quickly. That's an example of an adverb. Um, you could say, uh, do we need to know that the doll is beautiful? Maybe if it's important to the actual uh, defense in your writing, then add it. But if it's just an extra description, then cut it out. You just want to keep your words lean and clean and direct. But what if I find this hard? So the first thing you can do is to listen. So read the paper out loud, like I said before, slowly. Listen for those hesitations or bumpy sentences. You can use read aloud to hear it spoken back to you and listen to someone else reading your paper or have a friend read it to you. And when you hear it through their words, you might say, okay, stop. And then you need to fix something. You may want to highlight sentences that are over three lines long or are just half a line long. It's okay. Maybe it works and it's not a problem and it doesn't interrupt flow. Or maybe it's choppy or maybe it's wordy and it needs attention. When you're done this, maybe have a different reader look at it. Or if you haven't come to the right site yet, come to the right site and see if they're experiencing the same issues with flow. Um, and wordsmithing. They, they, we might be able to give you some resources that can help with that particular issue. Another thing that we focus on while editing is style. And style is how you express your ideas, your word choice, your phrasing, your storytelling. And your assignment style informs your writing style. So if it's a personal essay, then you can be a little bit more intimate with what you're writing about 
versus perhaps a research paper that requires you to be that to use that academic neutral voice. This is where AI can be a little bit of an issue because it takes that personal style away by giving you something that looks academic and really clean and wonderful, like, wow, it looks so well written, but it doesn't have your touch to it. So what, what's really important when it comes to academic writing is you want your voice to be there, to be the dominant voice, to, um, sharing the story with your reader and not just some bland computer output of what is supposed to be the best way of describing something. You always want to personalize the way that you're, you're writing because it is your academic expression. I mentioned how assignment types influence your writing style. So here are some examples. Like a blog would be for a more public audience, a discussion post, you'd be talking to peers. And this is all going to change how you actually conduct your writing because it, you have to pay attention to the audience of who's going to be reading it. So if one part of editing is making sure that the writing style matches the assignment type, that's one thing to look for. Um, as I was saying, in terms of AI, you want to also be editing for voice because you want to make sure that this paper is your paper. You are the voice directing the story. And this is how your instructor is going to be able to determine how you demonstrate critical thinking. Now, it's important in terms of voice to think about point of view. So there's first person. In singular form, it is I, me, mine, myself. In plural form, it's we, our, and us. And we would use first person in like a perf uh, personal reflection, a blog. And some research papers want that relational voice saying, I conducted this research because. Um, what you kind of want to avoid though is using first person in summaries because summaries are supposed to be neutral using the plural first person to describe society, like our society. Because what that does is it's, you're assuming that all the readers who read your paper will identify as, that be, as being part of that society. So it's, it's actually a way of excluding people and it's a good thing just not to use it. Um, describing intentions, I've seen this before in papers, like we will show Remember that it's only one person writing your paper, typically, so we wouldn't be writing in a plural first person anyways. Um, so just double check that that should say I will show. And I've also noticed that this plural first person, we, our, us, appears in introductions and conclusions when we're trying to kind of set the stage like, you know, our humanity, just speaking generally about culture and ourselves and society that's where they tend to pop up and that's where we want to catch them and correct them if it's not appropriate for the assignment. Now, before I get to third person, it's important to talk about second person because second person is you and your. And unless it's an expository essay where you're giving uh, directional advice, like um, you, these are instructions to follow. You would do this, you then do this, you next do this. Or in business writing, where you're writing to someone, let's say in a memo or a letter, using you or your is often used in academic writing to make a theoretical idea like, like suppose you do this, would you want this to happen? But it addresses the reader and it comes across in an informal way. So you want to avoid second person. The most popular uh, point of view, though, is third person. So in singular, it is it, its, individual, one, she, he, and plural, them, they, their. Of course, now we also have the inclusive third person singular of them, they, in replacement of he slash she. And that is in all of the documentation guidelines. So instead of writing he, she, just use them and they. Uh, we use a third person to create that neutral academic voice, that little bit of academic distance instead of putting our, ourselves front and center. But you don't want to use it in personal writing because that needs to come from you. 
So just look at your assignment instructions. Maybe it's indicated which one they want. And if it is, let's say third person, then scour your intro and conclusion for those uh, extra first person plural pronouns, because that's where they tend to end up. You really want your point of view to be consistent from start to finish in your paper. As you edit, you also want to keep scholarly voice in mind. And even if your assignment is um, like a blog post or a discussion post that can be a bit informal, you still want to write it with scholarly voice. This means writing academically, professionally, and informed, therefore avoiding slang. Contractions, some instructors may be okay with it. Contractions are uh, doesn't, weren't, hasn't, you know, where you take those two words and you put them together with an apostrophe. So what, what you want to do is, is expand those contractions to enhance scholarly voice. Exclamation points can come across kind of juvenile, so you want to avoid using those, again, unless it's what the assignment calls for. Using idioms and cliches um, just creates more of that informal voice. Adverbs and adjectives can, can add a, some drama to writing. You know, this was a great article or this was a terrible idea. They can be very extreme, so they're good things to keep in check. Watch out for humor because not everyone may share your sense of humor and it may come across in a way that's offensive. Acronyms, you know, this is when the way we text kind of finds its way into the way that we write papers. And you don't want to use those acronyms like LOL in an academic paper. Instead, stick to academic acronyms that are relevant to your writing. Certainly avoid swear words and emojis. And when I was talking about adverbs and adjectives, I used absolute terms of great and terrible. Um, you know, in, in academia, we want to be less extreme and a little bit more moderate than that. So we might want to say that was an effective article. Or maybe there was a challenge with this article and this is what it was. But nothing is absolutely great and absolutely terrible because there's there's different perspectives and different ranges and we want to have more of that neutral moderate tone as we write as well generalized vocabulary like things and stuff can just come across not specific enough and not really academic depending on your assignment you may want to focus on writing in active voice so passive voice refers to the passive verb to be. To be, you will find the following verbs. Is, was, are, were, be, being, been, to be. And the issue with this verb is that they, is that it creates a, a longer sentence. It can put the subject late in the sentence makes the sentence a bit more awkward and hard to follow um, and creates extra words. For example, the dog was walked by Kara is six words versus Kara walked the dog, four words. And this may seem kind of insignificant, but if you are over word count and but you don't want to cut any content, edit your paper if it's appropriate for active voice. Because two words here, six words here, eight words here, it all adds up. And that might just make the difference at bringing you back under word count without having to sacrifice content. So the passive voice is used when the subject is not important. Like the rat was put in the maze. It doesn't really matter who put the rat in the maze. It's just that the rat's in the maze. So it really depends on the assignment. But... Look at your assignment instructions, and if they are asking for active voice, this means you want to go through your paper and even highlight all these indications of passive voice, is, was, are, were, be, being, been, and think how you can rephrase that sentence to avoid that. Replace that verb with basically any other um, verb. In the example in front of you, and this is and the easiest way to change to active voice is when we have a passive verb 
in front of another verb. Let's just use the, sec the second verb of walked. Kara walked the dog. So um, that's just one way of doing it. And we can help you with this too if you find this really challenging, especially if English is not your first language. This can be really challenging. And so please come and see us and we can help you um, figure out how to move towards more sentences in active voice. Now, um, you know, Ernest Hemingway has this phrase of kill your darlings. And this is a really good editing uh, idea to keep in mind that if you've written a sentence that you're particularly fond of and you, you're really, really proud of, it could be a darling. And that means it may be amusing to you, but it may not read well to the, to the reader. This is why having our, those extra readers is so great because they may say, I don't know what's with this sentence, but it does not make sense to me. And, but to you, it's a darling. So you have to be able to be open to cutting those sentences that are you're fond of because ultimately clarity is your biggest focus when you're writing. You want your instructor to be able to follow your, your train of thought and not get distracted. So what about editing support? Just be wary of academic editing services. Our academic misconduct, mis misconduct policy states that plagiarism includes um, when paid or professional editors are used inappropriately, students should contact their tutor to discuss using an editor prior to submission of their coursework. So this is, if you are planning on using an editor, first of all, you need to tell your instructor and get their opinion on it if they agree or do not agree. Now for graduate students, there are academic editors who can help with the bigger papers like a thesis, a manuscript, or a dissertation. That is going to be a very different kind of editing scenario, but you do need to connect with your supervisor or program and ask their advice because they may have a list of approved editors that, you're, that you can work with that will still maintain academic integrity for your big paper. Uh, if that does not describe you, then please use the right site as we will teach you how to edit on your own and use those readers because they can really help you uh, help identify the spots in the paper that need more attention. How do I know when I am done editing? When you're tempted to submit it, because you can see big improvements from the revised copy. It's clean and smooth reading. There's a defined writer's voice, a clear story, minimal distractions for the reader, and you're sick to death of it. <laughs> but don't submit it yet. Give it one more round. Let it sit for 48 hours so that you can focus on proofreading. Proof, proofreading is getting in there with that magnifying glass and really identifying errors that are very small, that may seem minor, but could be very visually distracting to your instructor. Things like punctuation errors, spelling and grammatical errors, mechanical errors, documentation errors. And um, we, we have a common errors webinar that we run throughout the year. So please take a look at our webinar schedule for when it will be on next. That might be a good one to attend to get a, a sense of things to look for when you're proofreading. So in terms of punctuation, the typical errors can include using a semicolon instead of a colon or having um, having a comma where a comma shouldn't be, missing or extra punctuation, or having an overuse pattern where you're maybe using too many dashes or semicolons, that kind of thing. That becomes distracting. Spelling and grammar, perhaps you have inconsistencies with Canadian and American spelling. You want to stick to one. Um, perhaps you're using a homophone, which is words that sound the same but are spelled differently. You may be using commonly misspelled words like especially versus especially, or grammatical errors like subject verb agreement that you didn't catch in the editing round. That's why having this final round is so important because even though editing does such a great job of cleaning up your paper, it's not foolproof and some errors could be missed. 
Using an, er an, an error log can be a helpful tool when you're proofreading. And this is something that you keep all course long. So let's say you submit an assignment, you get it back, the instructor says there are too many comma splices in your paper. You would put in comma splice under error type with the example and then how to fix it with the edited example. If they're mentioning it to you, it means that it's enough of a pattern to be an issue and that it's something that will take a little bit of work to correct. Take a look at this error log as you're proofreading. Are you doing the same errors that you did last time? It gives you something specific to look for and the instructions on how to fix it. It can be very, very useful. Obviously, when we get a paper back and there's constructive criticism in it, it always kind of feels a little bit weird. But if we view it as clues and hints on how to improve future papers, then maybe we won't personalize that feedback so much. Instead, take those comments, put them into an error log, and then use this as a proofreading tool on your next paper. We also have a proofreading checklist that uh, you can access through the right site. So make sure to use that before you submit a paper. It really goes through a lot of detail um, to make sure that your paper is free of those few remaining errors. Before you submit, go over that rubric, that grading criteria one more time and review the assignment instructions one more time. This is a final check that you've done everything. Then if you can, you can let it sit for one more round or you can just submit it once you're done. You know, it, it doesn't hurt to give the paper one last read and if possible, one last read out loud before you send it off. Then you know when you've when you've gone through these this part of the writing process, revision, editing, proofreading. When you've invested all that time to go through those phases and do all of those checks and rounds of reading, you know that you know you've submitted the best possible version of this assignment that you are able to do at this time. You can feel good about what you've submitted. You can feel confident. I mean, we can never guess what the resulting grade will be, but you can at least have the comfort of feeling like you did everything in your power to make that assignment as good as possible. And so getting to this feeling is really important. And this is why we don't submit first drafts because you're, you're just, there's just too many errors that will be in that paper and you won't get a, a satisfying grade that you think is satisfying. At least here you've put in the work, you've invested in all of these strategies and you can feel good about the, about that investment. Therefore, the key to successful revising, editing and proofreading is planning for it. At the very beginning, when you have your assignment instructions and you have a deadline, even if it's a self-made deadline, make sure that deadline leaves room for a good week of revising, editing, and proofreading. This is what is going to directly impact your grade. So it's really worthwhile to include this in your writing process. Mm -hmm.